Hello there, and welcome to the I Never Knew podcast, also known as Inc. This show dives into the life experiences of people who have been through it all and have come through the other side stronger, better, and triumphant. Each story is raw, authentic, and at times, heartbreaking. One thing joins it all together, the fact that the stories can help the listener learn and grow. Hosted by Life Coach Maureen, she sits down each episode with a new guest who will empower the listener to set out on their self-discovery journey and start to heal. Now you'll be joined by Maureen and her special guest. Please enjoy the show. And welcome to the newest episode of I Never Knew or Inc. by Life Coach Maureen. I'm so happy to have all of our listeners here today. I welcome you. You are going to be so thrilled with our guest today. He's so interesting. His story is going to be so impactful. And I can't wait to tell you about him. His name is John Giordano, and he's gone through incredible life transformation. From the stigma of childhood sexual abuse, growing up in a mafia family, homelessness, and severe addiction, to being a renowned addiction expert with 36 years of sobriety. Oh, big applause for that. He started his own holistic treatment center with only $300, which he eventually sold for $45 million. Currently, he's a published author of three books, consultant for South Beach Detox, and the chaplain for the North Miami Police Department. He specializes in holistic mental health and trauma recovery. He's appeared on many national and local television and radio shows as a respected addiction expert and has contributed to over 73 scientific peer-reviewed research papers. So without further ado, my goodness, that resume just keeps going. Welcome, John, to I Never Knew Podcast. Thank you. I am- also part of that, but I'm also a grandmaster in the martial arts, black belt hall of fame, uh, oh. national karate champion, wow. and judo. I got a lot of things. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Well, we got Barker in the back. See, I love dogs. It's National Dog Day. It's only fitting that I should have a dog in the the background. So So, that's awesome. What we want to start with is to have you tell your story of what you want to... I'm so sorry. Hold on one moment, one moment. All right, John, so you take it away, whatever you want to do. This is your show. Tell us your story. Tell us anything that you think our listeners would love to hear. All right. How much time do we have so I know how to gauge this? We have one hour. Oh, okay, good. All right. I always start off a lot of my podcasts with what I wrote. Uh, I don't really need my glasses, but it's easier to read. Okay, it's called, uh, this book is called The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. Nice. nice. Okay, it, it, here is my roadmap for positive change. There is one thing in this world, one special lesson, one constant that has guided me through the turbulent waters of life. This infinite rule, which most people know, but ignore, or who simply do not follow their life lessons. That is, no matter what, no matter the circumstances, the obstacles, the people that get in our way or things that slow us down, follow this one simple rule. Never give up on your dreams. Never let go of your passions. And especially, never give up on yourself or a God of your understanding. My name is John Giordano, and I'm a recovering addict who has turned $300 into $45 million after I got into recovery. I was blessed to become extremely successful, and I like to share my story with you. This is how my life was transformed and how I was saved from falling into the abyss of hell and by following this one rule and learning how to have a life worth living. 
Wow. I love that. The foundations, you just gave foundations of living. How amazing that is. Well, Go ahead. ahead. So oh. tell us your story from the beginning, since this is, I never knew this is like, where did we begin? Where was the, the lowest point? And what are those profound moments that transformed you to where you are today? Well, you know, everybody has a story. Okay, this is just one of the stories that I was blessed to be able to rise above all the things that had happened to me. So it begins when I was growing up in the South Bronx, in Harlem in, uh, in the South Bronx. My neighborhood was one of the worst neighborhoods in the United States. Matter of fact, Time Magazine wrote an article. Uh, it was called Fort Apache, it was the police department. It was the worst place in the whole country. There was gangs and all kinds of things. Um, my father, um, we're Italian descent. We brought up, I was brought up in the projects. We're a lower income family. My father uh, sold produce, among other things. And um, anyway, when I was eight years old, my father got arrested for selling drugs and he wound up going to jail for four years. So I kind of grew up with, without a father for those formative years. At eight and a half, I was molested by some boys in the neighborhood. Now, what had happened was, is that, you know, I, I do therapy with people that have been molested. And it's very interesting dynamic that goes on. While I was being molested, part of me liked it. And I felt all the shame and his guilt because I wasn't supposed to like that. And um, I thought I had some evil inside of me. So I went to a priest and this guy went to a Catholic school. So I went to a priest and and said to me, if you could take this evil out of me. So he told me to do five Hail, Fa Hail Marys, 10 hour fathers, and you'll be fine. So we all know how that works. Anyway, when I was nine, I was molested by my babysitter. She was 14. And so that happened then. Then I winded up getting into gangs later on when I was about nine and a half, 10. I was in Hispanic gang, I was in a black gang. I was in an Irish gang, an Italian gang. I was in every gang known to man. So I was in those gangs for quite a while. And um, when I was 12, my mother brought me to the doctor and I was anemic. And she said, that's impossible. You know, I'm an Italian mother, I feed them, you know. <laughs> and what, what, what she didn't know was that the kids used to call me Fat John when I was a kid. So what happened was I stopped really eating. And I kind of had like almost like an eating disorder, you would call it. Yeah. So anyway, then I straightened that out. And um, when I was about 14 and a half, uh, we were riding down the street or walking down the street. We saw a karate school. And my friend and I were both in a gang together. And I said, you know what? I wonder how tough the karate guy is that's teaching there. Let me go up and I'm going to see if I can beat him up. Which I don't suggest, by the way. It's not a, it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> anyway, we, we, we went upstairs and uh, they, they were teaching the, uh, the classes and we were waiting around and it was getting late and I had to get home. And my father by that time was back out of jail. And I had to make sure I got home on time because he would stand behind the door with a belt and hit me on my butt. So I, I went home and I told him I wanted to join the class. I really didn't want to join the class to learn anything. I want to join the class to see if I could beat up the teacher. That's how stupid I was. You know, you're 14 and a half, you think you're, you got everything, you know, it's smart. So anyway, my, my father said, yeah, my mother said no. And eventually my mother gave in and they had to sign a paper. She had to be, at the time, this was 1962. You had to be 15 years old. So I went to the school and it was a jujitsu class, but I didn't even know the difference. And they had this small little guy with a round face and a little stomach on him. And he was teaching. We did rollouts and we did falls. And then he put us in a group and he, he said, um, I'm going to teach you how to block a punch. I need a volunteer. So, of course, I raised my hand right away. And um, as he was talking, I tried to sneak punch him. But oh, that's another thing. Don't do that. It's not good. Anyway. <laughs> all, the up, all the do not do's. <laughs> no, I winded up on the floor. I had a foot in my throat and I had a big round face looking down and smiling at me. Now, I didn't know how we got from point A to point B, by the way. Okay, all I know is I was on the floor. 
I fell in love with the martial arts. And therefore, what I did is I got out of the gangs and I went and started studying the martial arts. And I took all that anger that I had and all the confusion in it, and I put it into training. Wow. And I became a, a judo champion. And then I owned, then I became I, I did the karate. Then I became a karate champion. Um, all that stuff. By the time I was about 17 and a half, I um, got my black belt. And how that happened was my teacher, who was a famous, my, my teachers were very famous. There were Grandmaster Frank Rivers, who's known all over the world. Grandmaster Peter Urban, another Grandmaster who knows all, all over the world. Mr. Visitation, another one, and Grandmaster Hara. So these people were famous in the martial arts, and I was fortunate enough to learn from them. So what happened was my teacher didn't want me to leave because I was one of the top students in the school. And he says, look, if you want your black belt, I was already a black belt in judo and a black belt in jiu-jitsu. I just wanted my other black belt in karate because I was going to Florida. So what happened was he said, you have to take first place in these two tournaments. And one was on Saturday and one was on Sunday. Now, these were the biggest tournaments in the country. One was at Madison Square Garden, and the other one was in New Jersey. So I said, look, sensei, that means teacher. I said, can I just take second place at least in one of them? He said, okay. So he, he felt that I wasn't going to be able to do that in these tournaments. Well, anyway, I had a fight about 10 times, and I took first place in the first tournament. Then the second tournament, all right, I was fighting for first and second place with my dojo brother, Okay. Um, and he threw a side, it was 2 2, and he threw a sidekick at my, under my arm. And I wore a judo gi, so the judo gi was kind of big. So it really wasn't close enough to be called a point. Either you have to hit the guy or you have to be at least a couple inches away. Anyway, uh, they gave him the point, and he said, No, no, it's not a point. I said, No, 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 I don't care. I said, I don't care about taking second place. I got my black belt, so I'm interested. In it. So that's what happened. Uh, I got my black belt, went to Florida, and of course I was chasing after a girl, and uh, I didn't know anybody there. All I knew was one guy, and you know, and it was all kinds of the women were ten to one, and here I am, seventeen and a half, and I go to die and went to heaven. So anyway, <laughs> um, I was there and I started teaching karate. Uh, I had a little school, and um, the students used to come in stoned. And I would look at them and go, oh, okay. And I didn't do any drugs. I didn't drink, I didn't do drugs, I didn't do anything. And I said, okay. And then I walked them out so they threw up. And I figured that would discourage them. Well, it didn't. <laughs> so what wind up happening was uh, they came in the next day, did the same thing. And they said, well, you don't know what it's like to do this. And I said, yeah, well, I don't want to know, right? But what had happened was I had a neighbor that came into my apartment at the time. And he had this little bottle with clear liquid in it. And I said, what's that? He said, oh, that's LSD. So I says, oh. And I had heard about it, that it expands your mind. And I was always interested in learning and expanding my mind. So I said, let me see it. So he showed me, I uncapped it, and I drank the whole thing. Well, he was horrified. Because what I drank was enough for five people. Yeah. And I, I was on a journey for about, oh, about four days, day and night. Okay? And it was pretty wild. And, and, the, and thank God he knew what he was doing because part of that journey was, I don't know, for some reason he looked like a frog to me. And I don't have anything against frogs, but that's where I, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to kill you. And he said, no, oh, look at that light. And then my mind changed and we went on a journey. So I, I, I really liked what that was doing to my mind. So um, I started doing a lot of different psychedelics. I was doing peyote. I did mescaline. I had the LSD. And then I started smoking pot. And I didn't like pot so much because it made me always hungry. And, you know, it was just getting in my way. But then I met a girl, and eventually she was Jewish. I was high in. So the, her parents wanted her to marry a Jewish guy. And um, so they uh, eventually, she told him she was going out with me. And, and anyway, 
they met my parents. Now, they didn't know my father was a heroin dealer. My uncle was a hit man. My other relatives were whatever. They were doing all kinds of crimes. And um, they loved my family. Well, they, my family's a great family, except they do things that are a little off track. So anyway, my uncle threw our wedding. And um, what had happened was the caterer, it was really funny, the wedding, by the way. On one side, now, her father was a lawyer, and her mother was the head of the PTA. Now, my family, my father was a heroin dealer, and my mother was a homekeeper, and the rest of the people on the other side of the aisle, they were carrying guns, and on the other side of the aisle, they were carrying pens. So it was like, kind of, like kind of, <laughs> the dynamic was a little different. Right. Okay? So what had happened was the caterer insulted my uncle in the wedding in front of the people. So the next morning he killed him. And what 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 we don't know for sure, but we I mean, he killed him. Anyway, what had happened was the police were coming to my grandmother's house, and I had my whole new family was there. And she got a call and says, You gotta get out of here now. The police are coming. She's taking guns and throwing it down the chute. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. So anyway, it was four hours before we had to leave for the airport. So thank God for my mother. She said, oh, John gets anxiety. Let's go to the airport now. So we went to the airport. And meanwhile, what happened was uh, arrest them. eventually they arrested my uncle. Um, and they he was acting crazy, so they put him in a straight jacket. Um, they were taking him down a, a flight of stairs, and he dove down head first. And so they wound up putting him in a mental institution mm-hmm. for a couple of years. And then they went to court, and they couldn't proved that he did anything, so he got off. Uh, meanwhile, I started doing all kinds of drugs. I, I, was, I was teaching, I was doing uh, two sides of defense. It wasn't so bad the way I was doing it. Because drug, when you use drugs and alcohol, it, it, it hardly ever really starts off where it's a total nightmare. It's fun, it's exciting. And this was the 60s, so you know, Everybody was doing that, so it was just a common thing. Um, anyway, even though I was using, okay, on the weekend, and I was working out during the week, I did a lot of things. I did um, eight plays in the theater performing arts, uh, kabuki theater plays. I designed uh, plays where else I did uh, karate demonstrations. I wove them into a story format of a Shaolin monk a uh, young boy trying to be a Shaolin monk. And we took the, uh, we had storytelling, we had all that kind of stuff going on. And uh, we had uh, standing ro- room only in the Jackie Gleason Theater of Performing Arts in Miami Beach for eight years in a row. So even though I was using drugs, I still was doing things that were really cool. Um, I, there's a lot of, I, I could go into a lot of things, but I want you to read the book. So I'll, I'll I'll fast forward it. Um, what happened at one of the shows, uh, one of my black belts was an, also was an archer. And um, I saw in a magazine that this, this Oriental fellow was catching arrows, live arrows, okay? So I said, oh, if he can do it, I can do that, all right? So, but I didn't realize it was a 10-pound bow, which is a very slow-moving arrow. I used a 40-pound hunting bow, okay? But you don't even see the arrow. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So I put some foam on the arrow head, and we were practicing, and I was able to catch four arrows out of 10. But it wasn't good enough for the show. So I said, look, let's do it this way. You aim at my chest, okay? And I'll just move out of the way. And I had to have a plywood on side stage, so the arrow had to go someplace. All right, but the arrow I used was a hunting arrow, and it was like this, but it had blades on both ends. So just before he was, about 20 minutes before we were supposed to go on and do that part of the show, he had an epileptic seizure. He was an epileptic. Anyway, he, I had a dive on him. He was in a, in a, in a side stage, and we dove and we fell into a, a, a closet with all the screws, a maintenance closet. And so I'm rub, rubbing his temple lobes. 
I'm trying to not make him swallow his tongue. And uh, eventually I got him out of it. And then he had to go on stage and shoot an arrow at me. And if he miscalculated, he'd kill me. So I said, okay, can you do this, Bobby? He said, no, no, I can do it. I can do it. I said, oh, okay. And I was really very scared, but I did it anyway. Scared and stupid. I'll put it that way. For you. <laughs> trusting, I, very trusting. So it would come time for him to shoot the arrow at me as the guy's telling the story and this guy's attacking me with a, with a bow and he shoots the arrow and the arrow looked like it was just going like this. And I got out of the way and it sliced my uniform, went into the play where it almost killed the curtain guy. Oh my God. So after that, when the curtain closed, they started yelling at my black belt and said, listen, why did you shoot it so slow? Because I didn't shoot it so you couldn't even see the arrow. Why? I was so scared that my mind actually slowed that arrow down. It was really the wildest thing that ever happened to me. Wow. So yeah. that was that story. Now, as time went on, I, I started doing, I said it would never be like my family. I wound up doing collection work for the smugglers. Matter of fact, I used to go to Colombia and Cartagena, and I used to teach one of the, uh, the cartel's bodyguards. Okay. Um, then I was dealing drugs. So I was doing a lot of crazy stuff. Um, you know, we're doing collection work and I had a whole group of people and it was kind of like wide wild west. So I became exactly like my family and never got arrested. Never got even a misdemeanor and God was watching over me. And, um, so what wind up happening, long story short, uh, I also threw a, um, a concert with James Brown. And what had happened was I was working for Flea Market USA. It was a flea market. One of my students oh, was one of the owners and he, he asked me if I wanted to buy a booth. I said, no, I want to run your flea market. So he said, look, you know, I know you karate. I respect you. He said, but I said, look, he said, well, how much money do you want? I said, look, I want a thousand a week. Now, this is 1980, all right? So yeah. he says, a thousand a week? So I says, all right, tell you what, give me $250. You set me goals that you want me to attain. And then if I attain them, I want a thousand a week. So we said, okay. So that's what, three months later, I got my thousand a week. So what I did was they wanted a grand opening like no other. So I said, it was, it was 500 businesses under one roof. They had a huge, huge parking lot. All right, but it was in Liberty City and Overtown, that is in the black community, and they just had the riots there. Mm -hmm. So people wouldn't, didn't want to go into the neighborhood, they were afraid. So when I said, look, we need a theme. So what I did was I went to all the deacons and all the pastors, and all the priests, and this is before I became a chaplain, by the way, I was still using it. And I'm dancing with them in the church. And, and I said, you know what? I want to invite President Reagan to the flea market grand opening. So, of course, everybody laughed at me, right? I said, look, you never could tell. Look, the theme is we're revitalizing Liberty City and Overtown after the riots. They said, John, the president's not even going to answer you. Well, two weeks later, I got a letter from the White House. That's in the book, so in case people don't believe me. And it said, sorry, the president couldn't attend and do the scheduling, but we're sending a representative, and they sent Carrie Meeks, who was the state representative who later became Senator Meeks. And, you know, they really checked me out. So they checked me out everywhere, what, you know, who I was, what I was doing. And um, she went to the Martin Luther King Foundation, and they presented me with the Martin Luther King Award on stage in front of 60,000 people. Oh, my God. So Goodness. I know people don't believe these stories, but I have pictures of James Brown with all those people because I know how people are. So even though I was using, I was still able to function. Yeah. And that's what they call functioning, functioning addicts or alcoholics. There's a lot more stories, a lot more things that I did, but that's just a brief thing. It's just one more that you get a kick out of. It was Christmas time and they wanted something different. And I said, okay, look, I want to go up in a hot air balloon and I'll dress as Rudolph or Santa Claus and so 
and the balloonist could dress whatever he wants. So the balloonist was Santa Claus, and I was Rudolph the Red Nose Ranger. <laughs> and I said, I want to throw flyers out over the city. He said, John, you can't do that. We'll get tickets for littering. I said, no, you don't understand. I want to throw your money out over the city. He said, what? So I said, yeah. So what I did was I made up a sticker and I put it on the dollar bills and I turned them into flyers. <laughs> and we went up in the hot air balloon and we were throwing money out over the city. And we were on every radio station, every television station. And in the book, you see, it was on the front page of the Miami News. Oh my so, gosh. Crazy stuff. Then the fourth time that we went up, all right, the balloon caught a crosswind and we were going out to sea. And I said, I'm not going out to sea. I said, crash into the building. I'll dive through one of the windows. So the guy was crazy. So the guy said, no, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> so we were in the bay, meanwhile, and we'll go towards the ocean. So we said, look, I'll go along the bay. We'll hit the seawall and hopefully it'll drag us, okay, where I can shut off the plane. So I said, okay, whatever you want to do. We hit the seawall. And so happened there was a, a fire station there. And I, we had the firemen. They were laughing so hard. They were trying to put their clothes on, trying to get us. Right? I'm blinking. I have a little button. I was blinking my nose. It was turning red. Right? <laughs> and that's why they went out to help us with the balloon. <laughs> the fire department had to save Rudolph and Santa. I keep yeah, just... We crashed in a fire station. Oh. Gosh, I, I could just picture this and I love how you were so like okay do whatever you need to do just run into the building I mean anybody else is like ah, I'm gonna die and you're like okay whatever I love well, that's that how crazy I was, you know so anyway uh eventually what happened was I started getting out of control because now the drugs started really taking hold and it started to really mess me up with a lot of different things so my family did an intervention on me and interventions when your family members get together with a therapist and, you know, want you to go into treatment. Now, I told you who my family is. Yeah. So I was, was wondering who's doing an intervention on them. So <laughs> the right. family, who, who's the intervention for? And, and, and I mean, you know, I'm saying, well, wait, what do you mean you're doing it? So anyway, my, my mother said to me, she'll never talk to me again if I don't go in. And, you know, my Italian mother, she wasn't like that. I said, you know. Let me just do it, get everybody off my back. I don't have a problem. They're crazy. They have a problem. So I had some I had some coke in my sock. I went into the bathroom a <laughs> before I went up. And I went up to treatment. So here I am. I'm wearing dark sunglasses because I don't want anybody to know who I am. That's how stupid I was. All right, because I taught a lot of the doctors and nurses. I taught the kids karate. Oh, right? wow. But wow. that didn't work out too well. They knew, of course, they knew my name. And then, and then I came up from the business office to talk to me, and he was one of my students. So I was embarrassed. I felt, you know, really embarrassed and angry. And then I was in group, and then they told me to share my story in group, my deepest secrets. I said, if I do that, I'll have to kill you. So, you know, uh, I was the nastiest client you want to have, but my family knew the owners of the treatment center, so... They tolerated a lot of my stupidity. <laughs> and anyway, uh, what had happened was I started to clear up. You know, they detoxed me. And I was, my drug of choice really was cocaine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it took over my whole brain. And I started to clear up. And I started to realize how I was hurting myself and my family. So uh, as time went on, I started to... To clear up, I started to realize all these things, and then um, it was around Christmas time. I, I got clean December fourth, is when I went to the hospital, and now it's Christmas Eve coming, and I wanted to go home. Well, I didn't want to go home because it was Christmas Eve, and I didn't want my kids to see me in the treatment center because my friends would come over with Christmas cards with coke in them. Now, well, that was the only reason I wanted to do that, right? But I told them, oh, I want to go home. It's Christmas. How can you let my kids see me in here? which was baloney. So what had happened was um, they told me I couldn't go and I, I don't know about anybody, I don't know about you or anybody else, but I didn't get just angry, I got rageful. And it didn't just go away in 10 minutes or an hour. Sometimes it lasted for a couple of days even. So I went over and I punched the door in my room. I went and I never unpacked my bags. 
I always had them in the closet. I used to just pull shirts out and pants when I needed it because I was always leaving. I was always going to the elevator with my suitcases and they always would bring me back. Oh, John, talk to the therapist. And I would stay, you know. So anyway, what had happened was, I remember my therapist, he said to me, John, he says, do you ever pray on your knees? So I looked at him, I says, let me explain something to you. I went to Catholic school. I got calluses on my knees. I says, are you serious? He said, no, no, for humility. I said, why, God doesn't listen to me? How about if I'm in the closet, does he hear me? You know? He said, no, 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 no. And it, it just stuck in my head for a reason. And I was in a lot of pain, emotional pain. So I said, all right, let me get my knee down. And I couldn't put my knee down. Now, I know that sounds a little strange, but I couldn't get it down. So I finally pushed my knee down. I had to push my other knee down. And for the first time, we said, whatever's out there, God, energy, just take, please take this away from me. And it went away. Like it never was there. And as crazy as I was, I tried to get it back. I try to think about all the anger wouldn't come back. And that was my first spiritual awakening in treatment. Then I had another one. About a week later, they kept me for six weeks instead of four. Then I had another one. See, at, at, at the third week, at the end of the third week, they do what is known as exiting. So you sit in a room, very intimidating, by the way, with the doctors, with the nurses, with the therapists, and they give a report on how you're doing and when you when you should stay longer in treatment or the long-term treatment. So I'm in there and the doctor goes, John's been doing really well and everybody's saying how good I'm doing, I'm sharing in group and doing all kinds of things. So the head doctor turns, <clears throat> excuse me, the head doctor turns around, looks at me and goes, he's full of shit, just like that. <laughs> I, I looked at him and I called her all kinds of names. Then I turned around to everybody and said, you know what? I can kill all of you in this room. You'll never be able to get out of life. Okay? And the doctor looked at me. The other doctor says, you know, John, all we want to do is help you. And all I can tell you is tears poured out of my face. All right? I ran out of the room like I was this big. I was in my shoes running out of the room. And that's when I had that awakening. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> So, so much, so much humility, and so much for you to feel like. I feel like you had a persona of this tough guy, and letting anything or anyone in for vulnerability for you was the biggest struggle, I would think. Absolutely. Well, you know, there was this little sick little kid that was damaged. Yeah, never and healed. So it was the kid that was running the show, not the adult, and that's what you find out in a lot of addicts. Yeah, and in the child that you don't deal with all the trauma that I had. You know, uh, kids used to tease me and pick on me when I was a kid. And I was so afraid and things like that. I do. So, I you know, what had happened was, is that when I got out of treatment, is the thing, my wife picked me up with the kids. And she had a vial of Coke. And she says, yeah, just do one hit. You know, you haven't done it in a while. I said, excuse me? I've been in treatment for six weeks, and now you want me to do cocaine? So... I said, that ain't happening. But they told me not to make any changes over the first year. So we went to therapy, her and I. She was still using, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had two little kids. It was kind of rough. She wasn't a, this she wasn't like me. She wasn't a dysfunctional addict. You know, she was a, whatever you want to call her, addict. Okay? A functional addict. Mm -hmm. So that went on. You know, it was like, we got married, her and I. She was a Playboy bunny. Uh, you have Miss Jet, all that stuff. I lived in my karate school when we met. I had nothing. And she would pull up in a limousine, come upstairs and, uh, you know, give me some Coke. We would do Coke together. It was like crazy. We went to eventually getting married. Okay. It was like two empty shells getting married. Nice. You know? Yeah. So that, that, there's a lot of, to that story, too. And that's in the book also. So what had happened was after about nine months, almost a year, I said, look, I can't do this anymore. I told my therapist, I got to get out of this relationship. So I got divorced. Now, when I got divorced, what had happened was uh, she got the house. She got the car. Okay. 
and I had my clothes. So what the wind up was is I moved into my, I had a karate school at the time. I moved into my karate school. I lived in my dressing room, literally. Now the dressing room was, I don't know if you know, like there's like two buildings. They have usually have a space in between the buildings. Mm -hmm. You know, what happened was somebody put a roof on it and a back and a front. And, and they had also made an entrance into the storefront, which was my karate school. So it was like eight feet wide and 15 feet long. And that's where I lived. Wow. And what I did was, since I had no money, all right, because now I couldn't do collection work, I couldn't deal drugs, because I'm in recovery. Yeah. So, and you want to know, I'll tell you something, wow. Maureen, I was happy. I used to get out of bed. I used to take a shower, work out, you know, and, and, and that was peaceful. You know, I go to my meetings, you know, I read my literature. And for the first time, I was at peace. So what, what happened was, since I didn't have too much money, I went to all the stores in the neighborhood. And I went to a clothing store. And I said to them, look, I got the karate school down the street. How about I teach you karate? And you give me a shirt and a pair of pants. I had more clothes than the clothing store. <laughs> Then wow. I went to another place that sold vitamins. I did the same thing. And another place, a restaurant. That's where I got some of my food. So resourceful, what... resourceful. And and I know that I know a lot of people when they tell their stories and will say, you know, what is the one thing you learned about yourself? How resourceful we can be when we need to be. And I love that you, you said you were at peace for the first time. What I heard was you were living a simple life finally for you. Well, you know, and, and, and that's the story. Matter of fact, I wasn't, no, I'm sorry. I, 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 I said the wrong part of the, the, the thing. When I first got out of treatment, when my, I lost the house and I lost everything, my friend lent me a room. Okay, I lived in the karate school after that. When, when my friend lent me a room in a hotel that he owned, and I had a bicycle that somebody loaned me, I had a jar where I used to put my quarters in when I had quarters. And my kids used to come and all, we all used to cry together oh my goodness so you know that was that story the 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 one with the uh the school was earlier it's a whole different ball game yeah. anyway because i got divorced again because i married four times okay my father said keep doing it till you get it right <laughs> so i did it this time i with my my wife for 26 years 27 years she's unbelievable nice. anyway so I got tired of living there and crying with the kids. And, you know, um, I said to my friend, I said, you know, I really want to open up a treatment center. I have this famous doctor that wants to do it. And he says to me, John, he says, you got this doctor that wants I said, yeah. He said, well, you got the doctor. I'll give you the money. So he says, how much do you need? Now, what do I know how much I need? I was in a treatment center. I don't know what it cost to run a treatment center. I said, oh, a quarter of a million dollars. He said, Okay, if you got that doctor, I'll give you the money. Oh, then her desk. So I went to the doctor. He said, yeah. You know, I said, hey, I'd like to open up a treatment center. I got a quarter of a million dollars. Would you be interested? And he said, yeah. All right. He was like a comedian. You know, he said, I was just thinking about that, John. So anyway, <laughs> I did that. And long story short, I, I didn't know it was unethical. I took a lot of the people that were working in Mount Sinai Hospital where I went to treatment and I hired them for my treatment center mm. and I gave them double their salaries. Okay. And we had a very successful treatment center, but my therapist who I hired, who was making 29,000 a year, I gave him 50,000 a year. And um, he didn't like that. His client was his boss. Now <laughs> I was at his boss. I'm so happy he saved my life. I was trying to help him. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, long story short, uh, we couldn't make payroll and we were packed. Mm -hmm. So my friend that gave the money said, they're stealing. I said, no, I'm a street guy. I don't trust anybody. But I got to recovery. I got so, so many get stupid. So I said, no, nah, they're in recovery. They wouldn't do that. <laughs> so they started blaming him and he never even got to touch the checkbook. So I went into the doctor's office and said, you're stealing. He said, put his head down. He says, yeah. He was taking the checks that were made out to his name 
and he was buying hookers, buying apartments for them, and that's why we couldn't make it. Anyway, long story short, um, the therapist got everybody against me, and they took the treatment center out from under me. They said it was the other guy. So now I had to go to, I only went to the ninth grade. And I, I, in order to be a therapist, I had to have a GED at least. And now it's higher up, but back then it was just a GED. Yeah. So I got my GED and I did 300 hours in, in the school, okay, in the college to get my addiction training. Then I needed 6,000 hours of supervised training on the job. So long story short, they took the treatment center out from under me because I didn't have a lawyer. I didn't read any contracts, and I was speaking. You mess with me, I punch you in the face. Well, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. So I had to bite the bullet, and I stayed there, okay? And they let me stay. They gave me what is known as the outpatient. I had three clients, all right? So they figured that eventually I'd go away. They were supposed to get 25% of that. I never got my percentage. I got a salary, but never got my percentage. And... I was so hurt and so devastated that my therapist and my doctor screwed me out of the treatment center that I called my uncle up to kill them. And thank God, clarity came back because I called him back. He was getting on a plane and I told him, no, 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 no. Don't do that. Forget it. I worked it out. Okay? And I don't want to get into the whole story, but there's more to the story. You have to buy the book in order to let's see what happens. Yeah, you got to leave us hanging like this. I love it. I love it. Oh my so, gosh. Uh, so, I'll tell you how I got out of that program and what happened after I got my supervision. Yeah. I went to another program. I started my same friend said, I got another guy that wants to open a treatment center. Now, by that time, I learned everything about how to run a program, what it took. So I said, Oh, yeah. He says, Yeah. I, he says, I said, Okay. So he wants a business plan. I, said, I don't know how to write a business plan. You know, he went to ninth grade. What do I know? I got a GED. Right. You know? So he said, no, 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 no. He said, I'll write it for you. So he wrote it. I went up to see this guy in West Palm Beach. Two minutes before I get there, I realized I don't have the business plan. I forgot it. Oh. I was so nervous that I forgot the business plan. So anyway, I couldn't go back. I had to go forward. So I tell the guy, look, I'm embarrassed to tell you, but I thought I put it in my briefcase again. He said, I don't care. Here's a napkin. Tell me what you need the money for. <laughs> well, I wrote it down on the napkin and said I needed a quarter of a million dollars. I don't know, I keep coming up with that number. And we opened up a 30 bed facility. Very successful. After a year, okay, I didn't know he was a corporate raider. In other words, he would, guys like that, they hire people that know what they're doing. They have the people build up the companies and then they take it out from under them. Oh. Well, I did the same stupid thing I did before. I didn't even have a lawyer. And I had a contract and we got into it. One day, and he says to me, you're fired. I said, you can't fire me. I'm your partner. He said, read your contract. Oh, my goodness. I was going to throw him through the window. Yeah. All right? Of the office. And yeah. then I decided not to. I got all my, and now my sponsor, okay, I hired to be the clinical director. That was the program director. Uh, was making 29000 you know, 28000 whatever he was. And I gave him, I think, 50, just like the other guy. He bought a house. He says, come on, let's go. He don't know how to run a program. He says, I can't. I just bought a house, John. What am I going to do? So now here I am. I got my sponsor left me, but I understood. And this guy screwed me. And here I am sitting on my car with my box of my stuff that I had on my desk, crying. I couldn't believe it happened again. Yeah. Oh, so, and I became uh, a, a clinical director for an indigent place, a 55 bed. Um, it's called the, on the old TC, Therapeutic Communities. And and what they did was it was a not for profit. We have people that had HIV, dual diagnosed clients. By that time, I had my certifications and all of this stuff. So I was the program director and a clinical director, rather. And then what happened was I'm watching how they're doing treatment. It's like stupid. They would get people in the middle of the room. They would beat them up, break them down, and then build them back up again. I says, wait a while. I didn't need anybody to break me down. I was beat up myself on my own. I didn't need any help. Yeah. 
But anyway, that was their style. Uh, and then at lunchtime, we would feed them chocolate cakes and all kinds of desserts because we got all our food donated. And then, of course, with the sugar, eventually they would start acting out. Then we would put a sign on their neck, sit them on a bench to teach them not to do that. I said, we're creating it, and now we're punishing them. I said, that just doesn't make sense to me. Wow. So anyway, long story <clears throat> short, there's a lot more that went on. I left. Then uh, this woman I was with said to me, why don't you open up your own treatment center? I said, no, I don't want anything to do with treatment center. <laughs> I said, besides, all I have is $300 left. Now, I got 80000 from one place. Uh, New Life was the first treatment center. I got 80000 they gave me to get out of the second place. But I had a spending addiction. You know, I'm a street kid. I, I got a lot of money. All of a sudden, I'm spending on every stupid thing you can buy, right? Yeah. So anyway, um, where was I? Okay. So what happened was she wanted me to open up. I said, look, I only have $300. My friend had a building next to his uh, chiropractic office. It was a 750 square foot little house. And I said, look, Bill, uh, can I rent it? He said, well, how much money do you have? I said, well, how much money do you want? He said, how much money do you have? I said, well, I only have $300. He said, tell you what. Run for a couple of months, build up your, 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 your clientele, get your licenses and all that stuff. And then you can pay me $300 a month. I said, really? I said, okay. So here I am, okay. Now, uh, my friend that worked with me in this place called The Better Way, um, I asked him to be my partner. I said, look, I'll give you 50% of the company. Because he knew he was a business guy. I, I like doing the work, you know. So he says, okay, let me see your books. I said, what books? I don't have any books. <laughs> right. well, how do you know who pays you? Oh, they give me the money and put it in my pocket. <laughs> They'll pay me, don't worry. You know? <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. You can't do it, can't do it that way. No. I said, oh, okay, whatever way you want to do it, I don't care. I just want you with me. All right? So that happened. Uh, we had bill collectors chasing us. I opened up. Then I, there was a place across the street. I outgrew my, my treatment center. I was doing therapy in the parking lot because I couldn't fit them in the treatment center. Okay. Right? So there was a place across the street. It wasn't for sale. But he says, it's not for sale. I said, everything's for sale. So I <laughs> the woman and he says, to her, look, I want to buy your building. Because I knew she wasn't doing well with her practice. I said, I'll give you $25,000 more than the building's worth. But there's only one thing. You have to hold the mortgage. We didn't have hardly any money at all. <laughs> so he says, okay. So eventually we sold that building. We made 150000 <laughs> off that building. But anyway, that's what we did. And then I hired my daughter and I hired my mother. And eventually we built up. And then we had collectors chasing us for money. Sometimes we couldn't make payroll. But we still gave people treatment. And they didn't have any money. And they were motivated. Yeah, because it was something you knew it was important to do, regardless. We were, we were money driven. Yeah. Okay. But the money came, and it kept coming. And what happened was, uh, my my partner's son Gerald was an internet genius, and he came in, and I did the branding. I ran the the, the company. Jerry ran the business. It was a three legged stool. Long story short. We grew the business from that little 20, now it was 750 square feet to 2,500 square feet. And then we wind it up with seven buildings and 147 employees. And in 2012, we sold it for $45 million. Oh, this is You would have told me this story. I probably would have punched you in the face <laughs> thinking you're trying to make fun of me. Yeah. But we wow. were very. We were very blessed. One of the client's father was a multi-multi-millionaire. He saved his son's life. And that's what we do anyway. And he bought the buildings for us. And what we did is we paid him back for the buildings. So that's how we went down with that. My partner, we would get a thousand calls a day from the internet. And we would sell our calls for a quarter of a million dollars to other treatment centers. And we oh. took this one. He had 62 beds. So we had a 62-bed inpatient facility. We had an IOP, intensive outpatient. We had an outpatient, an aftercare. 
the one we became famous for is we were the first treatment center in the country. Okay, we're with Jaco accredited, which means it's the highest standard you can get that hospitals get for doing treatment. Wow. And what I did was I said, something's missing. My son almost died from this. I watched him put charcoal down his throat because he's a recovering addict too. And uh, today he's 18 years clean. He's the best kid in the world. But what had happened was I said, something, what do you got a five to 8% recovery rate? And what I did was I started to look for other things that cause depression and anxiety. Most people don't know this. It's not just a psychological problem. I wondered I'm getting hooked up with a lot of neuroscientists, and geneticists. And I don't know how it happened. God bless me, but it happened. We did hyperbaric medicine. That's oxygen under pressure. Yeah. Okay, not only does wound healing and, and uh, for TBI cases, which is traumatic brain injury cases, okay, it heals the brain. So drugs and alcohol damage the brain. Yeah. Okay. We did acupuncture. We did neurofeedback, biofeedback. We did, we checked for heavy metals. Heavy metals cause interference in the neurotransmitters. So it mimics bipolar disorder and attention deficit disorder. And Alzheimer's. Yep. Yeah. And then we had leaky gut syndrome. Okay. H. pylori infection, low testosterone, high testosterone. They all cause depression and anxiety. Uh, hypoglycemia, low thyroid, closed head injuries. So these are co-contributing factors. What I lecture about, co-contributing factors to addiction. Yes, yes. So what I also did was I, I got involved with Dr. Deborah Mash, who's a neuroscientist at the University of Miami School of Medicine. She's, uh, uh, she was the head of the Brain Bank and the Alzheimer's Foundation. She was doing research on a, on a, on a plant medicine called, I'm also one of the leading experts on plant medicine. It's another thing I do. Anyway, uh, called Ibogaine. I don't know if you're familiar with Ibogaine. No. Ibogaine is a bush from West Africa that the Weedy tribe use as a rite of passage. It's a partial uh, uh, psychedelic. Okay. I was thinking of ayahuasca. Well, ayahuasca is eight on the on the chart. Ibogaine is 10. Mm. And you get psilocybin, peyote, mescaline, San Pedro, and all the other ones. Mm. Okay, good. But Ibogaine detoxes people in 24 hours, which is unheard of. But not only does it detox you, it put, to put it simplistically, it sends you back into your childhood as an adult. And you have what is known as a cathartic experience. This is what happens. And they come out and they want to, they want treatment. They don't have any cravings. It's like a miracle. People don't even believe that until they see it. Yeah. Okay. So that's what I do with her. And um, I've been still, I'm working on for 20 years. Right now she's in England. They're doing what they call FDH trials for IBM. I, so I just, I, I find that so fascinating. Uh, I started in nursing and I actually worked in an Alzheimer's unit. So thinking of what you're saying is, oh my gosh, because all they do is throw them on the Ativan to control them. And it's kind of, yeah, everything's about throw a pill at it. And that's yeah. It and it'll go away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I love the holistic approach. And, and I think that's why life coaching is so much, um, G gaining so much ground and so wonderful today. Well, that's we interesting you, you brought that up. Okay. <laughs> I also work with geneticist, Dr. Blum, who's the one who found the addiction gene. There is a gene. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the main gene. It's the DRD2 gene, ALE1 variant gene. And there's a bunch of genes that are connected to it, but that's the main driver. All right. And he put together a, an amino acid formula and we have 15 papers on it, by the way. A double blind study, which is the gold study, gold standard. Okay. It upregulates dopamine. Yeah. Yes. So we do amino acid therapy with them. We did colonics to clear out the lower intestines. We did massage therapy for lymphatic drainage because drugs are also in the cellular body of your body, it's also in the cells of your body. Yeah. Saunas. Uh, we checked. 
for heavy metals. We check for allergy testing. We did also. People don't realize allergies can also cause depression and anxiety. Yeah. So these are things nobody, and they're still not doing it in the industry, did that. And we did group therapy, individual therapy. We did family therapy and aftercare. You know, all the standard stuff that everybody does. We did all of that also. Plus, we did trauma work with EMDR, uh, eye movement desensitization reprocessing, yes. which is incredible. That works very well. Uh, so those are all the things that we did. Now, right now, I'm currently something very interesting. I'm getting involved. And I wasn't going to do this. I was in Taipei lecturing at a neuroscience conference. I lecture all over the world. I've lectured to over, over 100 countries wow. about alternative medicine, how to treat mental health issues and addiction. And since I'm in, now I'm in 79 medical and scientific peer-reviewed journals, I have to upgrade that up on my website. <laughs> um, I'm into now doing, I'm, I'm buying into a ketamine clinic. Now, my ketamine, for those who don't understand that, it's an anesthetic, okay, but at low doses, micro doses, turns into uh, so like a psychedelic, and what happens is you start to go actually into what I call the hard drive, which is the subconscious, to have resolution on some of the traumas and some of these things that get in your way of your life. Yeah, that you don't even know. That you don't even know they're there. You don't there. even know because you're subconscious, okay? Yeah. Now, see, to me, ther talk therapy deals with the software of the brain. These psychedelics deal with the hard drive. You know, it's like your computer. You get stuff off the computer, but it's still on your hard drive. Yep. So it's the same thing with your psychological problem. Remember, which is an integrative program. It's not just the head walking around, because then let's send the head to treatment and leave the body home. Yeah, okay. it's all connected physically and mentally and emotionally. It's all there. So we're going to wrap up here. I want to ask you, this is, and, and I mean, I have an idea. I just love all that holistic stuff because that's, I'm actually um, going to be doing something for pets for in that same area. So I, t I ask every guest as we wrap up here, if you're marching down the city with 100,000 people behind you and you have a banner, what does your banner say, John? Real simple. Never give up. Never give up. Never give You didn't. Your life is a movie. I would not have... Oh, by the way, they're, they're, my, my, I have a producer, uh, Captain Sydney from Below Deck. I yes. Television show. I love she, that show. And I have another producer called Randy. And um, right now they're trying to get it into a movie. Yes, it I, it has to be a movie. Are you kidding? I want to see the hot air balloon running into the fire station. I mean, please don't leave that detail out. I thank you so much. Let us know where we can find you. Where can they find your book? I'm going to give you a okay, you the floor. On, there's a there's a few books. If you could go on uh, Amazon or you go to my website, John the Initial J Giordano dot com. And you'll see television shows and you'll see Alana Stewart, George Hamilton is on there, uh, all kinds of different people. Uh, you'll see some of the concert from James Brown. Uh, and you just go through all of that stuff. You see all the television shows, radio shows. That sounds fun. And I'm glad that you have it all in one place. It's amazing. So guys, John J. Giordano.com. Go look at his page. Go find his books on Amazon. I thank you so much for being here today. You're such a interesting man. And I just feel like you're the most interesting man in the world. I feel like I need, I need the movie. I need the movie and I can't wait guys. I thank you all for being here listeners and for joining me for this wonderful storyteller and this wonderful man who has turned his life completely around and has really turned it into service of others and especially reprogramming what he has had to go through through his childhood and to be the person that you are today is inspiring and aspiring and i just thank you so much for being here thank you for having me and, and, and allowing me to help some people out there too you bet that's what we're doing together all of us hey guys if you have any comments you want to get a hold of john you have any questions feel free to contact me at lifecoachmaureen.com you'll also see all of my 
uh, social media, my speaking and all my fun stuff, my books. And if uh, you want to go buy my books, they are available as well on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. My dog, as you can see, I'm going to do my prices right. There we go. Uh, my dog is more enlightened than I am. And my dog is my relationship coach. And how fitting on National Dog Day that we should go out and, and celebrate those puppies who teach us how to stay true to ourselves and to live life unconditionally. So for all of you out there listening, five-star reviews, share this platform, grow this community. We love you all for listening. And John, you're just a joy for giving me an hour of your time that you'll never get back that I am so grateful for. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the I Never Knew podcast. If you found today's episode inspiring and educational, please be sure to follow, subscribe, and spread the word. The more people that join the Inc. community, the more it can develop and influence others as we work together for a healthier and brighter future. Until next time.